الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Surely all praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the creator, the sustainer and the controller of the universe and all within and we invoke his peace and blessings upon his noble messenger his family, his companions, and all those who follow them in righteousness until the end of time. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Here we are, just a matter of a few days from the end of Ramadan. And so, today I would just like to remind you of certain things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an, in Surah Al-Dhariyat, وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ ذِكْرَةً تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And remind them, for reminders are beneficial to the believers. And, you know, one small issue that highlights the, the wisdom in reminders, because often, we tend to have the approach that, you know, we know this, everybody knows this, we don't need reminders. But Allah tells us that reminders are beneficial. And I think all of you will agree with me that one of the issues we face is that often before we begin the prayers, the Imam reminds the congregation not only to straighten the lines, but these days to also turn off their cell phones. And yet, often after the prayer has started, despite this reminder, mind you, we hear cell phones going on. I find it interesting that we're in Qiyam, mashallah, 3 a.m. or 2.30, and you hear the cell phones ringing in Salat al-Qiyam, Salat al -Layl. So reminders are indeed beneficial, brothers and sisters. Sometimes we don't even pay attention to the reminders. So I find it very ironic per se, that an imam tells people, reminds us, turn off your cell phones. And yet, as soon as the prayer begins, we hear the cell phone ringing. Now even if you forgot you have the cell phone with you, or you forgot to turn it off, when the imam says, please turn off your cell phones, that's the cue to check your cell phone, make sure the volume is turned down or it's turned off. So, this is just one little issue, brothers and sisters, that I, I, uh, I have mentioned to highlight the wisdom in this ayah in the Qur'an. وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ ذِكْرَ تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Remind them, for reminders are beneficial for the believers. And so, we should continue the practice of reminding each other because we will forget and we will repeat things that we should not be repeating and that's why reminders are beneficial. Now, the first thing I want you to remind you about is Sadaqatul Fitr or Zakatul Fitr or as it is called by some scholars, Sadaqatul Ramadan. <coughs> in fact, in a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, it is referred to as Sadaqatul Ramadan. Prophet ﷺ once gave Abu Hurairah anhu some dates that were from Sadaqatu Ramadan and he told him to, to, to take care of the dates. The most common name that we know or we use is Fitra. And this is a special charity, for lack of a better word, that must be paid before the Eid prayer at the end of Ramadan. So, I don't like to use the word charity because in this case, you know, charity conjures up the idea of something that is voluntary. But Sadaqatul Fitr is not voluntary, it's wajib. That a person pays it and pays it before the Salat, Salat al Eid. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, if you give it after the Eid prayer, it's just ordinary Sadaqah. So Sadaqatul Fitr is something special that the Prophet ﷺ ordered the Muslims to pay towards the end of Ramadan before the Eid 
and he ordered it to be paid on every member of the household who are Muslims. So even your young child, your, your infant child that you may have, a baby that is born just a day or two or a few weeks old, you have to pay uh, on behalf of that child as well. Usually the father is the one who takes on that responsibility of making sure that the sadaqat al fitr is, is paid on behalf of all members of the family. Um, this masjid and other masjids like the IIT have fixed the price at $10 per person. The equivalent of uh, what was mentioned in the hadith as one saw of tamr, of dates, about three kilograms of dates, $10 per person in your family. We highly, highly recommend people to pay it days before Salat al Eid. Unlike the time of the Prophet, brothers and sisters, where life was much simpler and the society or the community itself was not that large and huge. In the time of the Prophet ﷺ, it was actually possible on the day of Eid itself to give people, and the people were, they lived simple lives. So it was possible on the, on the morning of the Eid day to give them your sadaqah, and they would be able to also participate in the joy and in the festivities of Eid al-Fitr. Al These days, our lives have become more sophisticated. Our lives have become perhaps too sophisticated sometimes. And we have lost the simplicity. And sadly, and I'm not saying it's wrong necessarily to be sophisticated in life. You know, subhanAllah, Allah has blessed us, Allah has blessed us. But what we have to ensure, brothers and sisters, is that the sophistication does not become a barrier to our worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Many people in Ramadan, they invite family and friends for iftar. The problem is, and that's a good thing by the way, there is tremendous reward for feeding a fasting person, giving him or her food to break their fast and to, to have a meal after. There is no doubt about that. The problem is though, with this sophistication I'm talking about is often, when people do these iftars, and I'm not talking about iftar at the masjid, I'm talking about like private iftars. At home, you invite some family, some friends. They spend the entire day just preparing the food. So they have no time to read the Quran. In the evening time, as we come closer to iftar time, this is an opportune time for dua. An opportune time for dua. But people are busy uh, uh, preparing food. Instead of our hands being outstretched to Allah like this, our hands are busy doing food and preparing food. It's okay to feed people. But we don't need to let the preparation of the meals and the food itself become the objective. Many people on the day of Eid, they prepare because they're inviting people for Eid and that's, uh, that's a good thing, mashallah. But at the same time, because they're so busy preparing, they cannot attend the Eid prayer. But in the Sunnah, it is the Eid prayer that is more important. The Prophet ﷺ ordered the women who are even menstruating to come out to the gathering of the Eid. Not to pray the Salah, of course, but to listen to the khutbah and to be in the company of Muslims. Al Imam al Bukhari in his Sahih narrates this hadith in which a lady asked the Prophet ﷺ, what if a lady does not have the veil to come out for the Eid prayer, the gathering? Is it okay if she stays home? The Prophet ﷺ said to her, let her friend, her companion, lend her something to wear. Or maybe she uses part of hers. He did not tell her, yes, it's okay to stay home. That's how much he encouraged the Muslims to come out, to be in the gathering of Muslims. So, Allah has blessed us, yes. But the, the blessings of Allah should not be viewed or should not be enjoyed to the point where they become barriers. Because Allah has not forbidden us from enjoying. Allah says, وَكُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا Eat and drink. Enjoy, that is. However, Allah also says, وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا But don't commit excess. 
And that's our problem. Often we commit excess. All right, Israf is not just wasting. It is doing anything that is excessive. So when you prepare the iftar for your guest, mashallah, there is no need to have six or seven different types of dishes because each type takes time to prepare. Oh, this person like this, so I'm going to cook it. This person like that, I'll cook it. We have to maintain that balance. So in the time of the Prophet, salam, mashallah, life was simple. People led simple lives. These days, it is not so easy. In fact, it's probably very difficult or improbable that the Sadaqatul Fitr, given on the day of Eid, just before the Salah, will ever get to the recipients, maybe two, three days later. It can be done on the same day, or really. So we strongly encourage the brothers and sisters to pay the Sadaqatul Fitr a few days at least in advance. Abdullah ibn Umar, radiallahu anhuma, as the Imam al-Bukhari mentions in his Sahih, he would pay his Sadaqat al-Fitr two or three days before the Eid. And those days, lives were simple. On the day of Eid, you could give somebody your Sadaqat al-Fitr and they could go home and still be able with the Sadaqat to, to prepare for Eid and enjoy the Eid. And yet, he used to do it a few days before Eid. Because that's the objective. The objective is to all, uh, allow our brothers and sisters who are poor, who are less fortunate to also participate in the festivities of Eid. They may, they may want to cook some nice food or to buy some nice clothing for their children. They're not going to do that at the, at the Eid prayer. They want the nice clothing for the Eid prayer as to, in order to come to the, to, to the congregation. So the objective of Sadaqatul Fitr is to help and assist our brothers and sisters who are less fortunate to also share in the joy and the happiness and the festivities of Eid. So on a practical level, it makes a lot of sense to pay it up beforehand. It is sad that year after year, we see people rushing in and just before the prayer begins, they pay their Sadaqat al-Fitr. We have ritualized it, brothers and sisters. And all the ibadat of Islam, all the do's and don'ts of Islam are not intended to be rituals. They're very practical. They have objectives that they seek to achieve. So the Prophet ﷺ did not enjoin upon the Muslim Sadaqat al-Fitr merely as a, as a ritual. Salat al-Jumu'ah and the khutbah is not a ritual. Many people have ritualized it. Once they show up, it's okay. They have objectives they're intended to achieve. And so we should pay the Sadaqat al-Fitr insha'Allah before, uh, in fact days before Salat al-Eid. Today is the 26th day of fasting. We have just three days more of fasting and then Eid will be insha'Allah on Friday. So we still have a couple of days because the masjid, when it collects it, now has to go and distribute these funds. And it's not necessarily done in a day or two. And that's why many centers, what they do is, based on past years, they anticipate how much they may receive in Sadaqat al-Fitr and they give that out ahead of time from their own funds. Just because you and I sometimes are late in paying the Sadaqat al-Fitr. So let's do that. Let us also make use of the last few days we have in this month. These are the days, especially the nights for dua and for seeking to the, the pleasure uh, of Allah and seeking to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have only three nights left. Two odd and one even. You know, a week ago, we had ten nights. SubhanAllah, a week later, only three nights are left. And so you can see that despite the hardships we experience in terms of very little or no sleep during these nights, they, they, they're still coming to an end. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, once we are committed and dedicated and we're willing to sacrifice, He will reward us. No good deed, brothers and sisters. No sacrifice ever goes unnoticed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unrewarded. And nothing is too small for Allah to reward. It. Nothing. This is why Allah tells us in the Quran that on the day of judgment, that people when they're presented with their book of deeds will say, Mali had al kitab, la yugadiru sagiratan wa la kabiratan illa ahsaha. What's the matter with this book, this record? It did not leave anything big nor small, except that it recorded it. So nothing is too small 
whether it's a sinful thing or a good deed, it is recorded and it, 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 will, it, it, it will be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whatever sacrifices we make, whatever good we do, whatever du'as we make in these last nights, whatever raka'ats we pray in, in Salat al-Tahajjud, make the sacrifice, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward us. In fact, the greater the sacrifice, the greater the reward. Don't forget, these are the nights for du'a. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam has told us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always answers the du'a. And when he told the sahabas this, they said to him, إِذَا نُكْفِقْ If Allah always answers, then we will make a lot of du'a. Because every time you make du'a, you get an answer. And the Prophet alayhi salam told them, Allahu akfa. What Allah has is greater than what you can ask for. And the, 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 the message of the hadith is, go ahead by all means and ask Allah for whatever you want. So when it comes to dua, we should not be misers, brothers and sisters. We should not be misers. We should be very generous with our dua in the sense that we should make dua. But one important aspect of dua is what is known as al-ilhah, persistence in dua. <clears throat> persistence in dua. Now persistence in dua covers two angles. One is to be affirmative in asking for what you want. What this means is, as the Prophet actually has, has even explained in the hadith, he said, don't say, Allahumma gfirli in shit. Oh Allah, forgive me if you please. Say, Allahumma gfirli. Oh Allah, forgive me. Right? Be firm in what you're asking for. Don't say, oh Allah, give me this if you will or if you please. Because there is no one who can force Allah be exalted to do or not to do anything. And the, the attitude with the statement, you know, oh Allah, forgive me if you please. The attitude is, I really don't care for your forgiveness, oh Lord, if you please do, it's okay. If you don't, it's all right, it's okay too. No. As Muslims, our attitude is we need Allah's forgiveness and mercy and everything else so we ask in a form me oh Allah forgive me oh Allah have mercy on me oh Allah do this do that the other thing about persistence in dua is repetition of the dua person a logical person might say well you know God is God man why do I need to repeat myself oh Allah forgive me and I'm good no the Prophet has taught us Repetition is dua, in dua is part of this persistence in dua. Because in repetition, repetition in the dua brings out a greater level of humility and dependency upon Allah from the individual. And these are key attitudes, humility and dependency and need for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why, if you read the Quran, brothers and sisters, and look at the ayats in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about his messengers and prophets who made dua to him and he delivered them. Look at the time that they made dua. Look at the situation. What you will find is, these were situations when these prophets and messengers displayed complete dependency upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They displayed total helplessness. It, is, it was in those moments that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came to their aid. So if we display the same level of total dependency upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our dua, by repeating the dua, because it indicates we really want it, O Lord, and that you're the only one who can give it, that's why we're repeating it to you. Just like often when we deal with one another, right? when we ask uh, someone for something, often we just don't ask one time and that's it. You know, we repeat the, 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 the request. We repeat the request. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most generous. He is kareem. So let us utilize these, these nights of the last few days in Ramadan for dua as well. You know, of, of course, at the Hajj prayers as well as dua. And let us ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for whatever we want in our sujood. And also perhaps with the Imam in, in the Qudut. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept from us our prayers our du'as, our fasting, all our good deeds, and that He will forgive for us our mistakes and our shortcomings, and that He will cause us to be among those whom He would have forgiven in the month of Ramadan, 
and that he would cause us to be among those whom he would have showered his mercy upon in the month of Ramadan and that he would cause us to be among those with whom he is pleased in the month of Ramadan and may he cause us to be among those whose Next, he is set free from the hellfire in this month of Ramadan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cause us to benefit from the reminders. May he uh, cause us to listen, to be among those who listen to speeches and then follow and implement what is best uh, from it thereof. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our hearts and minds so that we can understand the message he has revealed for mankind. And may he inspire us to live by this message. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.